So um, we are going to be reading from Acts chapter 8, um, starting with verse 26 down to verse 40. Uh, before we get into those verses, let me give you guys just a backdrop or a bit of a history uh, leading all the way up to the life of Philip and the eunuch and how the Lord orchestrated all this and just blessed the whole situation. So uh, in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, the second half of verse 1, it says, At that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, and except for the apostles, they remained in Jerusalem. Now we know that nothing escapes God's hands, right? God is sovereign, God is in control, God sits on his throne. And so this persecution that's taking place against the church uh, caused the disciples and the men of God that were coming to faith to be scattered. And they went throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And then in verse 3, it says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So we see that there's a great persecution. They're coming against the church of Christ. And Saul here is causing a great havoc against the church. The word havoc means a widespread destruction. So Saul was on it, man. He was coming heavily against the church and um, entering the houses and dragging off men and women, committing them, committing them to prison. In verse 4, it says, Therefore those who were scattered... They went everywhere preaching. They went everywhere preaching the word. So we see the purpose behind the persecution. Like I said, God sits in his throne. God is sovereign. This persecution is taking place. Saul's causing havoc. But those that were scattered, they went everywhere preaching the word. I mean, th that verse really convicts me and confronts me and reminds me that wherever I am, there's my ministry. I'm to reflect the life of Jesus. I'm to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we're not all going to be super evangelists or Billy Grahams or Greg Lauries. By the way, the greatest evangelist is the Holy Spirit. But we're all called to share our faith wherever God would have us. So therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And verse 5 says, then Philip, you guys, here we uh, get Philip. Uh, we're introduced to Philip. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ. Uh, we know that this is the, the, these are the words, the fulfillment of the words of Jesus, right? When Jesus spoke to the disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, in Samaria, in Judea, and to the ends of the earth. That's the mission. That's the commission that, the, that Christ has given us as a church. So then Philip went down. To the city of Samaria, and he preached Christ to them. In verse 6, we see, And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did say that signs and wonders will follow his disciples. You guys believe God still does miracles? He does them every day. The fact that we wake up, the fact that we're breathing, the fact that we're thinking, the fact that we're reasoning, God is constantly doing miracles in and throughout our lives. Here there was an, you know, radical miracles taking place right there and then. And so Philip went down to Samaria. He's preaching Christ. Multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. We are to be faithful to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, regardless of what great persecution arises against the church or what affliction comes against the church. We're to be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 6, and they heeded to the things spoken by Philip. The Bible says that faith comes by the hearing the word of God. In uh, verse 8, it says, And there was great joy in that city. Truly, there is joy in the presence of God, but there is power living in the presence of God. And down in verse 11, it says, And they heeded him, because he had astonished them with his sorcerers a long time. Right, speaking of Simon. And verse 12 says, but when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. We know that he was not truly believing in the gospel of Christ, 
but he was believing because he felt he can get some power for his own gain. And so we see that as Philip goes to Samaria, he's preaching the gospel. He also finds himself confronting this man who was deceiving the people in Samaria. And if you recall when the disciples asked Jesus, what would be your sign of your return, right? And he tells them, take heed to yourselves that no one deceives you. The answer was deception, spiritual deception. And we see that taking place huge in our world. This guy Simon was deceiving the people there in Samaria, and they all believed him to be some type of great power from God. In verse um, 20, it says, But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you. After, Simon, after, after the, the apostles had come over to Samaria, they rebuked uh, Simon. And in verse 22, it says, Repent, therefore, of this. Your wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps you would be forgiven for your sin. We're to be faithful to preach repentance and share the good news in regards of the gospel. People need to repent. God requires for people to turn away from their wickedness and place their faith in Christ. In verse 25, it says, so when they had testified and preached the word, the word they're testified in the Greek is the word matureo, and that word means to testify on behalf of experience. In this case, on behalf of divine experience. They knew the Lord. They, had, they were experiencing the power of God. And it says they preached the word of the Lord, and they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So you see these men were taking advantage of the time. As they traveled, they preached. As they went, they preached. As they returned, they preached. In the church, I do believe they were to be busy today preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, wherever God would have us. And so now in verse 26, so we're going to read this together from verse 26 down to verse 40. Then I'll come back and break these verses down verse by verse. Amen? Amen? So let's read. Verse 26 says, Now an angel, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, or to the Gaza Strip. And this is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. And the place in the scripture which he was reading was this. It's Isaiah 53, right? He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and, and as, a, as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Verse 34 says, So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say Say this of, of himself or of some other man. And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see here, there is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Asotis, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you, God, for your spirit, Lord. We thank you for your presence. And Father God, we do pray that you would speak to us, Lord, as we go back and forth with these verses, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' most precious name. And we all say, amen. amen. So, so we know from, from just the backdrop of this chapter that there is a great persecution. Saul's causing havoc. The word is being preached in Samaria, which was really breaking barriers, right? Because the Samaritans were despised by the Jews. Uh, the Bible does, does tell us that in Christ, we're one. 
right? Um, in uh, Galatians chapter 5, it says that there is neither Greek nor Jew, but in Christ we are one. So there was barriers that were being broken in regards to the Jews despising the Samaritans. Another barrier was being broken between the Jews and the Hellenists. So, so Jesus, the Holy Spirit, there was power taking and people's lives were being brought together. Now, I'll tell you, we struggle with this. At work, I got a boss, and this man's a white man, okay? I'm not racist, but this man's just a white man, and he's my boss, and I was afraid to share the gospel with him. He's the boss. He has authority. He's a millionaire man, and I don't want to tell him about Jesus. First of all, I'm going to lose my job if I do. So, you know, I was going around preaching to others at my job site and telling them about Jesus and sharing with them what God had done in my life and where God delivered me from, but when it came down to speaking to my boss, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. And so I started praying. So I started praying, and uh, they called me to the office, and they wrote me up and gave me a write-up and said, hey, listen, Andres, you cannot be talking about Jesus anymore or inviting people to your church because we're going to fire you. And I said, oh, man, I got a wife. I got kids, you know, and what do I do, Lord? I, I can't quiet myself. I I've experienced the power of God. He delivered me from gangs and drugs and jail and all that mess that I was in for almost 20 years. I can't. I was sitting in uh, jail uh, facing a double life sentence thinking I was never going to get out, man. And it was in that darkest place, in the place where I felt there was no hope and didn't want to continue living. That's where Jesus reached and touched my heart. So I can't quiet myself. I can't silence myself that of what Christ has done in me. So I started praying, Lord, I can't listen to this, man. I need to listen to you. So the next day I go back to work and guess what? My coworkers start coming uh, and asking me questions. Hey, what does the Bible say about this? Is it true that Jesus, and I was like, oh, Lord, I get it. I get it, Lord. You want me to keep talking about you to these people. And so I did. So in my mind, I thought, well, um, if they call me into the office, I'm going to say, hey, listen, I didn't, I, they're asking me. They're asking me about Jesus. They're asking me about the Bible. And so I'm just telling them, you know. And that was going to be my excuse, right? And so then time went by, and I remember, um, I was sitting, we were in the, in the break time, and the Lord just spoke to my heart and asked me to share a verse with this man, and he was the top dog there. And so I said, hey, Mike, listen, um, I'm going to share something with you. And I said, hey, what profit does a man have if he gains everything in this world but loses his soul? And he looks at me and he goes, Andres, that is a good quote. I said, a quote, Mike? That's a, that's a Bible verse, and the only one that can save man is Jesus Christ, Right? And so I'm thinking, man, I'm just waiting for him to say, hey, go to my office, you're gone, right? So the whole day I was worried about him calling me over the intercom and him calling me into my office to tell me, hey, sign your papers, you're gone, you're, you're done here. So they, he did call my name over, over the intercom. And so there I go, I said, man, what am I going to tell my wife, my kids? But then you kind of feel, man, well, hey, it's, it's for the Lord, you know, preaching the gospel, man. Right? Like the apostles, when they were uh, brought into the council and they were beaten, they were left, and they were rejoicing because they counted it worthy to suffer for the Lord. So he calls me up, and I go up there, and he tells me, shut the door. I shut the door. And he starts telling me and giving me testimony how his twin brother had been preaching the gospel of Jesus to him for 15 years, but he had his heart hardened. And I'm like, man, you know, and he goes, you know what I realized? That you were willing to risk your job and your family for telling me about Jesus Christ. And he starts crying, and I'm like, oh, my God, you know. And so at the end, you're not going to fire me then? He goes, no, you know. <laughs> so he surrendered his life to the Lord, and, you know, he retired from that job, man. Yeah, yeah, praise the Lord. God is good, man. And so the Bible says he desires for all people to come to repentance. And so we see there was barriers being broken here. And so for me, that was a barrier being broken for me there at my job site. And the Lord touched this man's heart. He resigned. From that job, and he went to go work for a nonprofit uh, Christian organization where they raise funds for, um, uh, for small churches that need finances. Then I wonder, God, why didn't you bring him to our church? We need those ties, man. He's a millionaire, Lord. <laughs> so um, now in verse 26, you guys, after all this took place that we read in the first part of chapter 8, verse 26 says this. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. And we know that Philip was preaching the gospel in Samaria. There was multitudes coming to faith. There was revival. There was an awakening. Philip was busy. But I love the fact 
that Philip is attentive to the voice of the angel. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. I've seen many ministers and people in ministry fall in love more with the ministry than with God. And Philip here is attentive. He said, now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And this is a desert road. You're going down this desert road, Philip. And then the second part says, uh, verse, verse 27 says, So he arose and went. I mean, it doesn't matter how busy we might be in ministry, what God is doing. God is still wanting to do more. There's, there's multitudes, there's revival, there's a great work of the Spirit of God in the life of Philip. And God calls Philip and says, arise and go towards the south along the road. And take this desert road, probably dangerous, risky for his life, but Philip is going to go. You see the immediate obedience of Philip where it says that, he arose and he went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, so we know that Philip is, is hearing from the Lord. He gets up and he takes off and he goes um, as the angel of the Lord instructed him. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority. Number one, this Ethiopian, this eunuch, was a man who had great authority. And he was under Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. Candace is not her name. That's right, the title of the mother, the queen of mothers. Or the, how do you say that? No, 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 the queen mother. There you go. And so um, <laughs> the queen of the Ethiopians who had charge of all her treasures. This man had authority. He was running finances. And he had influence. And had come to Jerusalem to worship. So we know he was uh, converted over to Judaism. He was a religious man. And he was really seeking out the Lord. A searching heart. The Bible does say that in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 verse 9 it says, And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. This eunuch was truly seeking the one true God. Though he was uh, a man of authority, a man of influence, a man of money, he was seeking the one true God of Israel. And believe me, there is people out there that are hungry for God. And God has looked to you, to us, to share his word, his truth, his gospel to a world that needs it. Verse 28 says, this man was returning and he was sitting in his chariot and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Well, he comes over uh, and he doesn't really find what he was looking for because it is only God, right, who can fulfill the heart. It is only him who can satisfy the heart. But he found the word. And he buys a scroll, and scrolls back in those days were expensive. So this man was really seeking to know who the Lord is. And we know that it is God who causes the desire in us, right? It is him who called you. It is him who has chosen us. And so uh, as he's sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah, the prophet. And then verse 29, the second time, then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake his chariot. The first time it was the angel of the Lord. The second time now it's the spirit of Talk about being sensitive and attentive to the spirit of God or to the voice of God. What's distracting you today? What's distracting you? What's distracting me? We did chapter 10 earlier at the church. And by the way, the church is being blessed, you guys. I didn't want to go to that, to that city where God has me now. Uh, that's the city where I committed all my crimes and violence and gang banking. And we were trying to move towards more of a safer city. And we just didn't fit in that place anymore. And then someone calls me and says, hey, Andres, um, there is a, a building for, for Lee's there in the city of Maywood. And so um, when they said Maywood to me, it was like, went in here, it came out the other, because I'm not going back to the city. Uh, there's too much problems that I got myself involved there. We come to know that God is at work mightily and causing a revival and an awakening in that city. And I am privileged and grateful, man. Yeah, praise the Lord. Amen. So uh, I'll give you guys a quick testimony. Um, so, so we were at this place, and we didn't fit in the morning. I prayed, and I said, God, you asked me to open up a Spanish service because I'm fluent in English and Spanish. So I teach in English, and I teach in Spanish. And we didn't fit in this hotel. And so I prayed, and uh, like a day or two later, I get a phone call. And this guy tells me, hey, there's this building available in the city of Maywood. 
So when he said, make what I said, uh, you know, that's, I disregarded that. And then a couple of hours later, I remembered that I had prayed. And I'd asked God that we needed a place where we can fit. And I said, no. I said, no. You're sending me back to Maywood, well, Lord. I don't want to go back over there, Lord. I'm, something's going to happen to me or my family or my kids. Lord, you know what I've done in the past. Uh, before that, I had gotten shot in the church. I had gotten threatened by some guys to leave the church. So I don't want to go through that anymore. I'm trying to move to a safe place, right? Be wise, the Bible says. But there is no plan B. It's plan A, what God says, and that's it. And so um, I just kind of felt in my heart, man, I knew that God was going to send me back over there. And so I go over, I call, I made an appointment. I went over there, man, wearing shorts, sandals, a dirty shirt, you know, to present myself like that before the people that were going to show me the place, really <laughs> just showing a negative attitude towards it, right? And so they were asking for you know, a certain amount of money and papers and all that. We didn't have all that. And so I said, listen, um, you know, we, we're, we're praying. We're, we're, we're trusting in the Lord. And um, this is all I got. And if you can make it happen, I have, I don't, even, I don't have the deposit. We don't have the insurance. Um, I don't have the monthly income you're asking me for. Uh, but we do have is this and this and this and that. And she looked at me and she goes, well, I'll talk to the board people and we'll see what, what they're going to say. And... Um, so to make a long story short, she called me two weeks after when she goes, this time it was Pastor Andres. When she first saw me, she was like, are you the guy that, I? she was kind of, you know, a little bit startled. And so um, this time it was, hey, Pastor Andres, if you want the building, the building is yours. And, you know, just to move in there and to see the work of God, there was this one guy in particular that I had many fights with. I had shootouts with him from corner to corner. Uh, I mean, just horrible things, you guys. And I was afraid to run into him. So I started praying for him. I said, Lord, we're moving back over there. We're going to be there officially. And I don't know what's going to happen if I run into this guy because he was just as crazy as I was when I was out there doing my thing, right? And so I'm praying, and my wife and I and my family go over to Walmart. And I'm walking. I tell my wife, I forgot what I was going to the car for, but I said, I got to go to the car and get something. And I'm walking over there. And remember, me and this guy hated each other. I would have parked down the street from his house because I wanted to take him out. That's how bad I hated this guy, okay? And I literally had shootouts from him from across the street with one another. One time he came and stood in front of my house, and he shot up my house. And, you know, luckily no one was there. But there was a hate. And um, so I'm praying for him. And I'm in Walmart, and I'm, I told my wife, I got to go get something from the car. So I start walking down the aisle, and guess what? Here comes this guy. And I'm like, oh, Lord, my heart started pumping, man. And I'm like, you know, he saw him, and he does this. You know how the homies start, start mad-dogging, right? And start, <laughs> so he starts looking at me like this, and he pulls up his fist, and I'm like, man, Lord, you know, and said, God, be with me. So I walk right up to him, and I stuck on my hand, and I said, hey, Pete, I'm so sorry. Forgive me for everything I've ever done to you. And he looks at me, and he, he looks at me, and he goes, so you are a Christian. And I go, yes. He goes, me too. And I was like, praise the Lord. And I hugged him, you know. We started praying. And so you see, when you obey the Lord, you'll see the work of God. You'll see the work of God. Even though I was afraid, I, I put my fears to the side, man. I just, and, and you trust God. And now he's come to the church. Um, he's done some painting for us. He's met some of the brothers and family. Uh, they're at the church, and we've had breakfast and dinner, and we uh, did some testimony, and it's brought healing to the city. And people are like, wow, man, these guys literally hated each other. There's a couple of officers that I used to run from there in the city. Matter of fact, <laughs> I got into shootouts with some of these officers, man, and, and you know, they hated me. I hated them. With one of them, I did a documentary for US, USC, and he literally called me a monster. That was his, that's how he viewed me. And, um, uh, so when I first got out, I ran into him and told him, hey, the Lord changed my life. And he goes, yeah, you've been out for six months. And for a long time, he didn't believe me. And we're going on 13 years, and um, uh, also the Lord has restored our relationship where we've gotten to do some stuff at some juvenile halls. Uh, we've had some dinners. We've had some breakfast. Uh, now we kind of joke around, and it's just beautiful what God does. Amen. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, right? <laughs> And um, so Jesus said, love your enemies. Yeah. <laughs> we got to practice that, you guys. And uh, for me, I've gotten my taste in that because, like I said, God has restored these relationships that are healthy for our community, you guys. Um, so 
Okay, so verse uh, 29, then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So we need to be attentive, church, attentive, sensitive to the voice of God. And have a submissive will, a willing heart to obey that which God is asking us to do. There's people you work with, there's family you know, there's people we run into all the time and they need Christ. Don't let the enemy, Satan, silence your voice. Don't compromise your walk. Be a clean instrument, a holy instrument. And God will use your life powerfully. As the Spirit spoke to Philip in verse 30, it says, So Philip ran to him. What do you do? He ran. Talk about eagerness. Talk about joy. Talk about a desire with eager to serve the Lord. Now, I've run into people that act like they want to serve God. We're not in Hollywood. We're not going to get no star or nothing like that, man. You know, God, I don't have this desire. I don't have this eager, Lord. Give it to me, Lord. Set me on fire, Lord. Give me a longing. Give me a desire, Lord. We're living in some very serious times. Great deception everywhere. You ask people, what do they think about Jesus? Well, he was a historical figure. He was a good man. He was a prophet. He was this. He was that. Deception. And many people are believing it, just like the people were believing in the Samaritan, that man, Simon. And the gospel was preached through Philip, and then the elders came, and they rebuked this man, and repent from your sin, Simon. I've had my shares to share with people that govern our city, and I've been able to share with the mayor and some of his councilmen, and um, I remember going over and sharing, and said, hey, listen, man, God is doing a work here in the city, you know, and um, it would be good if you can repent from your sin, put your faith in Christ, <laughs> And let's work together. We said, well, he's, he don't need Jesus. And uh, he rejected the gospel. And recently, they just did an audit. I don't know if you guys saw it on the news. Uh, they raided his house. They raided his businesses. Uh, he's now in question. And I remember sharing with him and saying, hey, listen, listen, man. Hey, God loves you. I love you, man. But there's a work of God in the city. The city here doesn't need, in a sense, more money to change people's lives. The city here needs hope. It needs Jesus. It needs Christ. And you're the leader. You need to turn away from your sin, receive Jesus, and be a blessing to our city. But he said no. And so now there's consequences. God deals with people day in, day out. And so we need to be sensitive, you guys, to the Spirit of God. God has divine appointments for us daily. God doesn't get tired. He doesn't grow weary. I remember telling a guy told me, uh, he goes, man, you you need to leave God alone. He's busy. What? (laughs) he's not you know he's looking to save people redeem people transform people just like he did with all of us right just like he did with every single one of us have a story we all have a testimony we've all ha- we've all had divine experiences so we can testify the greek word marture we can testify on behalf of divine experience and so it says that Philip ran, you guys. And so, uh, I mean, just what an eager, a joy in regards of serving God. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And verse 31 says, And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? We read in the book of Romans, you know. How will they know no one goes? How will they understand him? No one tells them or teaches them. And so here we see that as Philip obeys the voice of the Spirit, uh, he runs to him and he, he hears that he's reading the prophet Isaiah. And he said, do you understand what you are reading? Listen, we are to disciple people and disciple men within the Scriptures. You, we can't disciple men out, outside of Scripture. We disciple men through the Word of God. And in, in the heart of Philip, I believe his desire is to what? To preach the gospel to him and to share and give him insight of who Isaiah is talking about. So he asks him the question, do you understand what you are reading? And verse 31 says, and the eunuch said, how can I unless someone guides me? I don't know what this passage is talking about. I'm confused. I don't know if it's talking about Isaiah or Israel or someone else. You see a searching heart, a hunger for the truth. There's people like that out there, and they're around us, at work, at home, out in our communities, in our cities. 
The problem today with a lot of brothers and sisters in the church is that we're distracted. We're distracted and we're busy here and busy there and we don't have that availability or that openness or that sensitive to the Spirit of God. Kind of like in chapter 10, right, when uh, Peter is about to pray and he says he got really hungry. Doesn't that happen when it's time to pray or read? Oh, the phone. Oh, my neighbor. Oh, I'm hungry. We need to have a life of discipline. In God's word, in prayer, uh, Cornelius is a perfect example of that. In chapter 10, um, verse 1 and verse 2, it says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. A committed man, a dedicated man to the one true God, he was a captain. This, actually, these, this Italian regiment was known to be loyal. Loyal. A devout man and one who feared God with all his household. Listen, his life, his commitment, his dedication, him being a man who feared God influenced his household. Our faith needs to be contagious. Our lives need to question other people's beliefs. And so this man, Cornelius, was one who... Uh, also was generously, uh, a, a giving a generous man and, um, and a man who prayed always. That needs to be us, church. Amen? Okay, now, so um, after the uh, Ethiopian uh, says, you know, how can I unless someone guides me? So he says, and he asks Philip to come up and sit with him. And then verse 32 says, the place in the scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its ear is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who would declare his generation from his, for his life is taken from the earth. And we know that that's talking of no other than Jesus Christ. Our Lord, our King, our Savior. I was over in Israel uh, last year the group of brothers. And my prayer was this, God, I'm going over to Israel. Yes, I'm excited. I'm emotional. I want to see all that I've been reading in the Bible. And, um, but I also want to preach the gospel, Lord. I pray that you would open up doors, that you would place Jews that I can share the gospel with. And so as we got into the plane, the brothers sat down with brothers, and I'm like, man, who am I going to see? I'm looking to see if I get, you know, a cool brother. <laughs> But I didn't get no brothers. Everyone else had brothers that they knew. They, they, they were, it was a long flight. I had never been on a plane 16 hours, my first time. Dude, I was, I needed some comfort, man. But I didn't get it. So the Lord brought me three Jews and they sat right next to me. And then I remembered I prayed and asked God that he would put Jews in my past so I can preach the gospel to them. And ask them why they keep denying Jesus. And so before we got off the plane, those men had accepted Christ. The guy says, Andres, we want the God you serve. And I said, yeah, his name's Jesus, bro. You got to repent. Stop living a life without Christ and accept Christ. And the Lord blessed him, you guys. And then as we went over there, um, we know we land. And, man, it, it was my first time. So when the plane started shaking, you know, I was like, God, I knew you were going to gather us all up together and take us home. And we're gone. I'm not going <laughs> to. I was afraid. And, um. So we land and we get to Israel. And remember, my prayer was God used me to preach the gospel, Lord. There was a couple of times where the Lord called us out at nighttime. And I said, oh, man, one of the brothers goes, are, are you serious, bro? And I said, yeah, let's go, man. Let's go tell people about Christ. So we went on to the city of David, the outside walls of Jerusalem, and telling people about Christ. There was this one, um, uh, this took place. We, we, were, uh, we went to the food courts and... Um, there was like four Jews sitting there, and they kept looking at me. And they started laughing at me while they were looking at me. So I'm like, why are they laughing at me? Do I got something on my face? <laughs> well, <laughs> they were making fun of me. They were, you know, they were saying, what, what a, who is this dumb guy wrote on his face, you know? And I, I kind of, you know, read that, and I kind of discerned that that's what they were doing. And so, so I, I try to talk to them. I try to communicate with them, but um, they just didn't understand English. And I was going to try to share the gospel with them. And so, anyways, you know, I kind of figured, well, you know, I told the guy, hey, let's go. We started walking, walking away, and then these, uh, this guy and this, uh, this couple 
comes behind me, taps him on the shoulder, and he goes, hey, how are you? And I turn around, oh, you speak English. And I was surprised, right? And so I started talking to him, and, and you know, he told me, hey, I saw, did, I go, did, he, go, he, he asked me, um, you know those guys were making fun of you, right? And I said, yeah, I did. They were, huh? You, what were they saying? He goes, they were talking about your face and how dumb you are. Why would you do that? And I'm like, yeah, I figured. And he goes, but you were cool about it. And I said, yeah, man, you know what? I really was looking, uh, I, was, I was looking at that as an opportunity to talk to them about Jesus. Do you know Jesus? And I started telling him about the Lord. And, we, and by the time we got to the light, he wanted to accept Jesus Christ. And, you know, God, you guys, wants to use every single one of us. And then there was our tour guy. Our tour guy, our, our tour guy's name was Ronnie Simmons. You guys heard about that guy? Okay, so Ronnie Simmons is a, he's really known in Israel. He's written many good books uh, regarding the history of Israel. And so, you know, um, he don't believe in Christ. And um, so I started, you know, talking with him and asking him, you know, questions about, you know, uh, their, their, their culture and their beliefs and stuff like that. And so it came to the point where I was going to preach the gospel to him. And so after all that talking, going back and forth and looking at Isaiah and looking at Isaiah chapter 53, you know, um, I, asked, I said, look, Ronnie, look, at, forget about your nation and, and your beliefs and all that. Why do you deny Jesus? And he tells me because the Bible says that when Messiah comes, there was going to be peace. And when Jesus came, there was no peace. And I said, that's where you misunderstand scripture. The peace that God is given is, is the peace that we have in Christ. We're forgiven and we're redeemed. Christ has made peace between us and God. And we have the peace of God through Christ. And so I start going back and forth with him like that. And um, I think maybe the second day, no, the last day uh, that we were there in Israel, I, I, I went, you know, um, and hugged him and said, Ronnie, God loves you, bro. I love you, man. The church here loves you, bro. You're a good historian. You, you know, I, I enjoyed what you were teaching. But that's not going to get you to heaven. You keep rejecting Christ, and you will end up in hell. And I said, consider the gospel, Ronnie. Consider the gospel. Listen, your insight, your knowledge, your nation, all that is keeping you from seeing the truth in the Bible. Open up your heart, Ronnie. And he looked at me, and his eyes got watery, and he put his hand on me, and he goes, Oh, Andres, I will. Because we were going back and forth, I mean, every day. And uh, Pastor David Zamora, you guys know him? He was right behind me, and he was about to tell me to leave him alone. But the Lord rebuked him and said, no, you leave Andres alone. Let him tell him about Jesus. And then Zamora said, man, Andres has to be one of the most persistent Christians that I know. And so, you know, he, he told me that, and you guys check this out. I was blessed by that. And I've been praying for him. I've been sending him emails. And uh, you guys remember when Harvey hit in Texas? Well, I saw a post on Facebook, and I saw that there was a, um, a need for a dumpster truck, so for a, a, yeah, for a dumpster. And so then I get all spiritual, and I start praying, God, provide for a dumpster truck. And in my prayer, the Lord says, go. But, but Lord, I was praying for provision, not for me to go over there. <laughs> right? And the church is doing good. There's revival. There's people coming. People are getting saved. People are reconciling. Kind of like Philip. There's people, there's people getting blessed, you know, and so... Um, so I, t I tell my wife, hey, honey, I, man, the Lord wants me to go to Texas, and I, I got I to gotta buy a ticket. I got to go. And then check this out. She was afraid for me to go by myself because I was going to go by myself. And she starts praying, God, please send somebody with him. And at that moment, that man right there calls me, Brother Henry. And he goes, hey, I'm going to Texas with you. <laughs> <laughs> so I bought a ticket for him, and we took off at like at 4 in the morning to Texas. And then I came back. I flew back, and my second time flying back out there, I'm, in the, I'm at, at the airport. And I'm with Robert this time, another younger brother, and I'm walking out of the airport, and the airport's alone, and guess who I run into? Ronnie Simmons from Israel. And I looked at him, and I said, Ronnie! And he goes, Andres, you know? And I'm like, man, bro, Jesus is so pursuing you, bro. Did you repent already, Ronnie? Did you accept Christ? And he's getting all red, and he goes, I still have some time left. Because he said he was going to take a whole year to consider the gospel. So keep praying for Ronnie, man. But I know God is on the move, you guys. Right? We sing the song, God is on the move. Hallelujah. Right? He's on the move, you guys. And he want to work, wants to work through us. So, yeah. So now um, in verse 34 it says, So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? 
of himself or of some other man. And that's truly what, what was going on at the time. People were talking that that passage is talking about Israel or the prophet himself. Uh, but we know that it's talking about Christ, right? And then verse 38 says, Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture. And uh, a practical note for us here is that when we open up our mouths, let's open up starting with scripture. Amen? I remember going back and forth. I worked with some guy. And everything he told me, the Lord was just giving me a Bible verse. And a Bible verse. And he would say this, and a Bible verse, and a Bible verse. He goes, man, bro, you got a Bible verse for everything. He was mad, right? But to me, that was like testimony. Is this true? We need to always start with scripture. A preacher, I forgot who is, what his name was, but he said, he said, as a preacher, you have nothing good to say outside of the Bible. And I'm like, oh, man. I don't know if I fully agree with that, but you know what? Listen, we, I know that we need to start with scripture, with the word of God. Not with our opinion, not with what I feel, not with what I think, simply what the Word of God says. Because there's many people that end up placing their faith in what they think and what they feel and what seems to be right. Our faith needs to be founded in Scripture, period, nothing else, the Word of God. And so then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this Scripture, preached Jesus to him. And that needs to be us once again, church, preaching the gospel wherever God would have you. I have learned in preaching the gospel, there is going to be people that are going to reject the message, that are going to not like what you're saying. But you know what? That's healthy for us. It's healthy. It helps us to grow. It helps us to draw close, closer to God. It does. And I remember being at the church, and these guys came, and they started shooting at me, and people in the church there and they sent me a message that I had to leave in 30 days or they were going to take me out. I was afraid. I got a wife. I got kids. My life's in danger. I don't want to die. God already saved me, you know. I want to live now for the Lord. What do I do? Do I leave or do I stay? I look to God and I look to hear from the Lord through Scripture. So I prayed. And the Lord said, you ain't going nowhere, Andres. You are going to stay here. I said, okay, Lord. That means God was going to protect me. So these men that really wanted to come and take me out, uh, they committed a crime somewhere else, and one got 16 years, one got 20 years in prison. Now, I wasn't happy for that, but I was thankful that God protected me, and, you know, I felt okay now. So God has promised he will never leave you or forsake you. He is with you wherever you go. And through the preaching and going through these um, experiences of being rejected and being, you know, uh, afflicted or uh, people coming against the message, it would help you grow spiritually. Your confidence, your faith, your trust in God will grow. And then I remember coming to the new place. Like I said, I didn't want to come back to Maywood. Some guy passes by and pulls out a gun in front of us in front of the church right there. And I'm like, oh, Lord. But I kind of knew that was going to happen. And so we... Um, you know, it didn't go so well, but at least we got to pray for him. And he ended up coming to church and receiving Jesus. And he moved out. And I'm praying that God is working with him wherever God has him right now. So, um, you see, there's power, you guys, in the name of Christ. This guy passes by, pulls out a gun in front of me, in front of one of my brother's daughter. And it's like, man. And we start praying. And then God touches his heart. And he comes to church and has breakfast with us at church. You know, the power of the Spirit of God, it convicts people. It touches people's hearts. And uh, now verse 36 says, um, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water, Philip. What hinders me from being baptized? In other words, what else do I need to do to be baptized, Philip? And I talk about the excitement, right? Here this eunuch wanted to express his faith in Christ, wanted to publicly announce that he was a believer in Jesus. See, here is water, Philip. What hinders me or what needs to be done, Philip? that I would be baptized. And then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We should be longing and yearning to hear those words from people we preach to. You know, when, 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 I get, when the Lord sends me out there, we're, out, we're in church every day. We've got service Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, uh, we have proactive ministries in regards of boxing, kickboxing, uh, 
piano classes, drum classes, guitar classes, vocal classes, art classes. We're busy. In scripture, you don't see Jesus going around telling people, I love you. He demonstrated it. He demonstrated his love to people. And so these classes and these things that we're doing, they're, they're free. You know, and we're telling our community through these uh, works, we love you guys. We love God. We love you guys. And we care for your kids. We want to get them involved in these classes, in these music classes. You know, the kids today, they're, you know, stuck on these games. Like digital cocaine these days. And so it's been a blessing to see that the community responding to that. And as God brings these people and they come with their kids, we get to pray for them. We get to pray for them. We get to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And my prayer is, God, as you bring these people and as they sign up for kickboxing or boxing or piano or guitar, whatever it is, Lord, will you touch their hearts and will they respond and accept and confess Jesus and believe with all their hearts that Jesus is the Son of God. And it's been happening. You know, as we're praying for people, sharing with people, people opening up their hearts, asking for prayer, confessing. I mean, it's just amazing. The love of Christ needs to be demonstrated by the church. Amen? Wouldn't you guys just love a revival out of love, man? And so, then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then verse 38 says, so he commanded the chariot to stand still, to stop. Stop the car. By the way, it was a 1964 Chevy Impala. It was convertible. <laughs> Not just kidding. <laughs> but he says, stop. Stop this car. I mean, this guy's excited. Man. He's really being convicted in his heart with the spirit of the Lord. And he come to know the truth of Jesus. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. Stop the car. Then it says, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And so it says, now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. So, you know, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. So we're to baptize people. To get, we need to go down the water with them together. We, we, we do them, right? I told the guys, listen, next time we baptize, I'm going to go down there with them. You repent, brother, Okay. Now you're gonna, we're gonna, you're gonna stay down here. <laughs> but he went down with them, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And verse 39 says, Now, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip. What a supernatural work of the Spirit of God, right? Philip is phew, gone. The Lord takes him, caught away. Listen, may that be us. May we be caught away by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God came upon the apostles. That means when the Spirit is governing you, when he's governing our life, and it is him who is leading. The Bible says we don't know where the wind blows or where it comes from, right? But we see the effects of it. And that's how the Holy Spirit works. Where you see the Holy Spirit doing the work, there you go. Pastor Chuck Smith said, ask God for discernment. Ask him to show you where the Holy Spirit is leading and just get in there. That's where it's at. You and I don't lead the Holy Spirit. You and I don't tell the Holy Spirit what to do. We ask God to give us discernment and to open up our hearts and minds to the leading of God's Spirit. And so the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. You can imagine the eunuch, right? Man, you know, he's accepted the Lord. He believes in Jesus. He just got baptized. And then now Philip is just gone like that by the power of God. And it says, after he sees that, he sees sin Philip no more, he went on his way rejoicing. Why? His faith was not in Philip. His faith was in Jesus. We don't lead people to us. We lead people to Christ. I've been in churches where all they talk about is their pastor or the elder. We need to be talking about Jesus. It's him. He's the shepherd. Him is Christ. And so here Philip, uh, Philip is called away with the Spirit. Like I said, may that be us, you guys. May that be us. May we be caught up with the Spirit of God every day of our lives. May we wake up in the morning. God, show me thy way. Show me thy love. Show me thy power, Lord. Here is thy servant. Here is the... I surrender. Right? We just finished worshiping the Lord, telling him we surrender, Lord. Okay, let's live it out. Let's live it out, man. I've always been challenged by that quote that A.W. Tozer said, 
when he's preaching to the congregation, telling the congregation, Christians don't tell lies. You guys heard that one before? Christians don't tell lies, and the church is saying, yes, amen. They only come to church and sing them. And in my heart and my mind, I'm like, man, you know, Lord, <laughs> help me, Lord, help me. I, I need you, Lord, desperately, Lord. Lead me, Lord. Show me thy way. Show me thy love. Show me thy power. Lead me in thy path, Lord. Every day we have that opportunity. And so may we be caught, up, caught away, you guys, with the Spirit of God. And uh, so Philip went on his way rejoicing. And his, it, the reason why he takes off rejoicing was because his faith was in Christ, not in Philip. It was in the Lord. He had a true encounter with the truth of Jesus Christ. And then verse 40 says, But Philip was found in Asotis. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And like we said earlier, through the persecution, all the brothers were scattered, right? And they were scattered to Judea, to Samaria, um, uh, the, from Jerusalem to Samaria, to Judea, and here to the ends of the earth. The very words of Jesus from chapter 1, verse 8, and you will be witnesses to me. In other words, your lives will be a reflection of mine's. Is that, the, is that the case with us today? You remember when Philip, uh, when uh, was it John? Yeah, uh, Peter and John, when they were brought before the council and the elders, the leaders, the, what did they say? We've realized that they had been with Jesus. We've realized that they had been with Jesus. May that be us, you guys. May our lives, may the faith that we profess be contagious and convict others. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. I am to believe. There's two different things. You can believe in God and or believe God. We, we, we believe in God, yet we have faith in Christ. God has called us. God has chosen every single one of you guys. What a beautiful thing it is, right? Uh, Psalms chapter 65, verse 4. Blessed is the man that's been chosen by God. He called us. He chose us. We're only responding to the Lord. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. But I am also to believe all that God says. Two different things, believing in God and believing what God says. If God tells me there's power in the name of Jesus, I'm going to believe that. And it's going to be seen when I practice that. God says there's power in the Spirit of God. I'm going to believe it. God says pray. I'm going to pray. God says preach. I'm going to preach. Because I believe we need to believe the Lord. And so last verse, verse 40 says, But Philip was found in Asotis and passing through, you guys, passing through. What are we doing as we're passing through our cities, our neighborhoods, our schools, our communities, through our family? Are we preaching? Or have we grown weary? Are we tired because people are not responding? We need to continue, you guys. Paul, the apostle, tells Timothy to preach the gospel, to be ready in season and out of sea. In other words, always be ready to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So Philip was found in Asaltus and passing through. He preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Faithfulness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I will tell you this. Um, when I was sitting in jail and I figured, man, I'm not going to get out anymore. I'm done. Uh, I'm through here. And I remember being in there sitting in that jail cell. And remembering all those times my mother spoke to me and said, Andres, you need to stop doing this. Andres, you need to change. Andres, you need to do this. And I never listened. I've always mocked my mom. My mom always told me, God's going to change your life one day, Andres. And you're going to be a preacher for the Lord. And I said, Mom, you're crazy. I am a gangbanger, and I'm going to die a gangbanger. And who's crazy now? <laughs> She'd always tell me that. You know, a, a, a loving mother who cares for her child. You know, this was her hope. This was her faith. This was she believed that God can do in my life. And so I was sitting in this jail cell, and I remember, you know, um, in my heart feeling, man, what if I would have listened well, what if I would have listened to my mother? What if I would have went to church? What if I would have accepted Jesus into my heart? 
Because I was in a cell and I was there by myself. No one came to preach to me. I, it was a work. Now I know it was a work of the Holy Spirit. Because I started asking myself, what's happening? Why am I feeling like this? I'm supposed to be tough and I'm supposed to be hard. And I'm not supposed to be crying. But I was. I was hurt. And I came to realize there was a little boy inside crying for help. Abandoned as a child, abused as a child, molested as a child, left by my father as a child. Grew up in the streets since I was 10 years old. I found acceptance in the gang, and I found love there. Though I was deceived, I found it there. And I was willing to die for the gang. I was willing to do all that was asked of me because I would get a pat on the back that my father never gave me. And so um, being in there and the Holy Spirit tugging at my heart, what, you know, what's happening, right? And so I responded to that, and I prayed, and I said, God, man, if you could forgive me, please, Lord. I don't know if there's hope for me. I don't know if, if you can forgive me of all the things I've done. I, I just don't know. And I had an experience. I had an encounter with the Lord. I went to fifth grade school. I never learned how to read. My, my, my reading was horrible. Um, so when I prayed and I just sensed and I knew God was there with me, tugging at my heart, he took in this burden, this weight off of me. And I just had it having this, just praying and I can hear the echo of God's voice. And someone had given me a Bible that I had in my personals. And I opened, I picked up that Bible and I started reading. I started reading and I started, I read through the whole gospel of Matthew and I understood. I didn't know how to read. I couldn't comprehend. I remember What? God was there with me. And then, how am I going to tell the rest of the guys that I don't want nothing to do with? Because I had to raise my hand in there to get involved with politics and, uh, you know. What am I going to tell the rest of these guys that are facing the death penalty or, or life in prison, who are in there angry and they're violent and just looking for an opportunity? Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. It's looking for an opportunity to take off on somebody or hurt somebody. What am I going to do, Lord? And so I prayed, and the Lord said, just like you served your gang, you're going to serve me in this place. Man, and I got fired up. It was like the big homie telling me, you're going to go, okay, Lord, let's do it, Lord. And so I got out of my cell and I went to every cell. They gave me my 15-minute walk. And I started telling everyone in every cell about Jesus Christ. And ever since, we haven't stopped, my wife and I. This is what God has called the church to do, to preach the gospel. Philip was evangelizing. He was filled with the spirit of God. He was faithful to the call. He was sensitive to God's voice. He was faithful to the message. He started with scripture. There was persecution. There was havoc. There was affliction. But there was joy because the presence of God was with them. But there's also power as we live in the presence of God. The Bible says, dwell in Christ, dwell in me, and I'll dwell in you. Amen?